Greetings all and welcome to another session here of Tuesday Talks. Today we're going to be looking a little bit more at the history of the English language and primarily the modern regional English in the British Isles and how the birth of dialectology uh, emerged uh, in the 19th century and, uh, and what we've learned from all of this study of, uh, of dialects. I'm going to begin by just looking at the beginning of dialectology. Uh, there was a gentleman, Joseph Wright, he was a great linguist, and he believed that dialects were disappearing. Does this sound familiar? In earlier lectures, I mentioned the same thing. They wanted to get these dialects written down before they went away. We'll hear uh, a couple of, uh, maybe a hundred years later, we're having the same type of thing again. These dialects were disappearing, and they thought they should be preserved. So they're going to go through and uh, try to uh, write all these down. Another uh, linguist, Alexander Ellis, uh, he uh, uh, wrote a book on the early pronunciation, and it was a survey. And again, based on the work of these men and others like them, there was a decision made in 1873 that uh, the English dialect uh, dictionary, right, they had a job to undertake uh, to develop this uh, book by going out and collecting all this information from all these different dialects. And that came from the English Dialect Society. So now there are going to be people going out there trying to collect and write down these different dialects. One of the variations, one of the things that they noticed as they were going out and collecting information is that one of the accents, one of the dialects, had something called uh, TH fronting. And that's where basically you're replacing the TH sound, th, you know, you bite your lip, th, and replacing that with ep, where you're biting your, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, where you're biting your lip this time, not your tongue. So we had words that were changed from think to think, brother to brother, thrust to frust, right? And I frust my sword, uh, right? Thought and fought. Oh, I fought you were coming with me, right? Do you remember the Doolittles from the uh, movie um, uh, Professor Higgins, right? Uh, my Fair Lady. Uh, in that movie, you saw the same type of thing. The, the people there who were speaking that accent, that dialect, uh, would drop their THs. So there were things that were happening. That was just one noticeable thing. Now, the uh, Society for English Dialects, they were working on doing this, and they quit after about 20 years. Decided that they were done collecting all the information that they needed to collect, and their work was done. They could now go away, okay? And they were, they couldn't be more wrong. Language and dialect do not simply stop or disappear. They continue to evolve depending on the circumstances. You get a group of people within a subset or within a special location and you're going to have dialects emerge. So this whole idea that they quit was definitely a mistake on their part. Um, you also should know that uh, during this time there were a lot of different surveys that were going on. People who were trying to collect dialects, not only in in uh, Great Britain, you know, but also uh, not only in England, but also in Scotland and other areas as well. Actually, that was happening in other parts of of uh, Europe also. People were creating these dialects. Some of the notable ones were the Survey of English Dialects, the Linguistic Survey of Scotland, the Survey of Anglo-Welsh Dialects. <laughs> It's hard to imagine all these different dialects. You go to New York City, you go to New Jersey, you go to Philadelphia, uh, and you'll find similar uh, groups and subgroups with uh, with uh, distinct accents. Uh, well, I say distinct, with distinct uh, characteristics of their dialects. Uh, people can make region and regions and accents to go with them. Uh, we like to make patterns. It's just the way we are. So. We've got two groups of people making patterns. You've got the people who are using language, using this particular dialect, and you've got other people who observe language, and they prefer looking, they like looking at patterns. In fact, that's what this thing up here is. The brain is simply a pattern map, not simply, one of the things that it is. It's a pattern matching system. Um, and so we like looking for patterns, and so that's why we do analysis, uh, normal analysis, and in this case, we're doing linguistic analysis. Uh, so we're a people, we're a, a species that likes to make and identify what these patterns are. And that's what we're doing when we're looking at dialects. Um, one of the things we need to recognize that as we like to make dialects and we like to make little boxes to put people in, to put whatever in, we like to categorize. Um, I need to understand that these groups in, in uh, these categories, these boxes in essence, don't really exist. You cannot create a dialect of southern Philadelphia 
create all the rules and regulations and say anybody who follows these has that has that dialect belongs to that group. Uh, it's much more of a continuum. People have certain characteristics, and it tends to be more prominent maybe in a given area, but that doesn't mean that everybody in that area is going to follow those rules. Um, so they're not strict in that sense, but they do offer clues as to where someone lives, what someone's educational background is, maybe what their ethnic background is. So it gives you a, a clue as to an area. It's more vague uh, in, in its description, but it does point in you in a particular direction. There is definitely an advantage to understanding dialects. And, of course, the people who were doing this research survey here at the, in the, the late 18th and 19th centuries, they, they were learning about these different um, patterns, being able to judge people based on those patterns. Now, to be honest, we have all these different types of variation, and whether you study linguistics or not, <coughs> you're going to judge people. And we judge people based on a variety of things. The variations that we typically look at are in pronunciation, vocabulary, and grammar. Now, with regard to pronunciation, we normally don't say that someone uh, is pronouncing something incorrectly. It's wrong. It may be funny, it may not be good, but it's not wrong, right? Um, we tend to judge people based on how they pronounce things, and we may judge them to be a certain type of person, to be a certain type of character, uh, based on that pronunciation. We don't say it's wrong. When someone misuses the grammar of a language we'll point that out that's wrong okay uh, it's not different or unique or you know but it's not wrong typically it's just different uh, but we do judge people based uh, on their pronunciation we judge people also on their vocabulary um, but that's going to be a little different so and we also judge people on uh, grammar and those are considered wrong uh, someone messes up on the grammar, it's wrong. Somebody uses different vocabulary, we may say at some point that it's wrong, but it's also sometimes where we say it's the richness of the language because there are so many different words that we can use. Um, and we do judge people based on the vocabulary that they use. And a good example comes from um, a movie from uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. And here's a little blip here that you may want to enjoy. It's an example of... Uh, the difference in language and how people are being judged by it. I didn't know he was taking on captives. She's invoked the right of parlay with Captain Barbosa. I'm here to negotiate. You speak when spoken to. And he'll not lay a hand on those under the protection of parlay. Aye, sir. Apologies, Miss. Captain Barbosa, I am here to negotiate the cessation of hostilities against Port Royal. There were a lot of long words there, Miss. We're not but humble pirates. What is it that you want? I want you to leave and never come back. <laughs> I'm disinclined to acquiesce to your request. It means no. I really enjoy uh, the way the way that he responded to her in that little example. He used her big flowery words, but at the beginning he says, "Look, we're just humble pirates. We're not as good as you are with all these big flowery words." Okay. In other words, he was judging her based on these big words, and he also tried to say, "Oh, we're just no, we're nothing compared to you." But he was judging her. Of course, he then turned everything around when he answered her and said that he was disinclined to acquiesce to her demands, right? Means no. <laughs> Playing with this vocabulary, a form of judgment. You, who are my students who may be listening to this, you need to recognize that the vocabulary you choose may impact the way someone uh, views you, just like in your pronunciation. Um, so the richness that you have may be a good thing. It may signal to somebody that you're intelligent or smart or more properly schooled in, in uh, language. Uh, but it may also mean that you're, you're, you know, you're better than somebody because you are. Um, pronunciation is a different animal. Again, grammar is a different animal. But all, all these ways that we can be judged because of it. Some other pronunciation changes, okay? 
um, the received pronunciation, or the RP, or the King's English, I guess you could call it, is the pronunciation that was to be used when you were uh, in school, when you were learning language, when you were using language. Uh, but again, things happened with the dialects that were going on. People would change things. I mentioned earlier about the TH fronting. Another one here is the roticity. Uh, and that's where they would drop sounds. They would drop the R's at the end of words. For example, we have near and near. Okay, it's near the door. Okay, we drop the R's. And by doing that, we're creating a different pronunciation sound. Certain dialects did this. And these are all examples of words that sound exactly the same. Cheetah and cheetah. Right? Uh, formally and formally. Right? Mana, mana, and mana. Right? Rhoda and Rhoda, right? Schema and schema. Tuba and tuba. Custody and custody. Fama and fama. Okay? They sound exactly the same in certain dialects because the R is dropped. The only way that you understand what those things are is because of pronunciation. Uh, I'm sorry, is because of context, the context that you're in. Um, so this was another example where you saw that type of thing changing. There were other differences in pronunciation. They, people would pronounce letters because they were in a word, as we saw earlier, uh, when people were saying things like humid uh, and uh, honor. Here we're adding, uh, we're pronouncing H's uh, that weren't necessarily there before. So we have words like when, where, what. <coughs> we have the dropping of sounds as well, for example, in house, and people would pronounce it house. Uh, people would replace uh, a stop, okay, and a stop is where you completely stop the air, like for the example, the sound T. When I say stop, when I get to the T sound, I stop all the air, and I create a little explosion as I go. Well, this word here, written, okay, can be replaced with a glottal, where you stop it not with your teeth in the middle of your mouth or at the on the roof of your mouth, but you stop it in the back. Written, okay, written, and you're stopping it in the back of your mouth with the, with your tongue, okay? That's a replacement as well. <coughs> Paper's not going to fit here. Uh, gotten, didn't, right? I didn't. Uh, one of the jokes that my, uh, my, uh, my children often say. Okay, now... These are just pronunciation differences within dialects, within the different accents that you have throughout Europe, and actually you could say throughout the eastern seaboard as well. And uh, there are some people who notice, and that's a key word, they notice that there are differences between the way they pronounce things and the way other people pronounce things, and then they, they want to get rid of that sound. They don't like that sound. Noticing is key because there are a lot of people who walk around and say, I asked you a question, and they don't even notice that uh, you know others pronounce it asked, asked you. I don't even put the K in at all. Uh, but you have to notice to understand. And people try to avoid the stigmatism by learning a new accent, learning a new dialect. Why? Because of their identity. They want to look and appear differently. And so what they're doing is they're saying, Hey, these people pronounce language this way, therefore. Um, I, I don't know about you, but when I go to a different locale, uh, I like to learn that different accent. I go down to Tennessee, or I go to, uh, uh, I go to uh, England, you know, I go to Birmingham in England, or, uh, and I hear the accents that are there. I, I, very quickly, I want to pick up that accent. I want to pick up that dialect uh, because I enjoy them. But I listen for them. I notice them. There are other people who aren't noticing. Of course, those who want to change their identity, uh, for whatever reason, also will do this so that they can learn um, a new dialect. Here's another example of someone who decided that they wanted to change or learn how to pronounce in a different dialect, a different accent, so that they could get a better job. Okay. Yeah, why don't you just start with, uh, you know, your name and okay. where you're from. Well, hi, my name is Lauren LaGiudice. I grew up in Howard Beach, Queens. It's uh, about like 40 minutes from the city. It's not that far. And then I went to school in a high school in Queens. And then I went to college at Wesleyan University. And that is where everything started to change. Plows. Cries. I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times. For many actors, learning a New York accent can be the avenue to a great role. Old in our hearts, 
This is British actor Daniel Day-Lewis in Gangs of New York. Stains the very streets we walk today. Walks. Uh huh. But for New York actor Lauren Lo Giudice and for other New Yorkers in all walks of life, the key to success may lie in losing their accent. Mm -hmm. The wall. <laughs> it's, a, it's so hard. When I became an actor, I just knew it was holding me back. And people would see me as, as a street character, someone um, kind of rough around the edges. And so in order to change the way people saw me, I had to work on my voice. Ah. 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 And in the last year, when doing that, it has transformed the roles that I'm being cast for. Uh, Who is that? Hi, Reed. My son. Oh, come on. I must have told you about him. Listen, it looks like you're busy. I know I should have. There's a movie coming out when Harry tries to marry in February. It just debuted at the Austin Film Festival. And I would have never gotten that role if I was talking like that. Open up the jaw. Like other people seeking to change how they sound, Miss Lo Giudice found a speech teacher to help her make the transformation. It's in Manhattan. Yeah, I can't Rather than it. Manhattan. Manhattan. Yes. People come to me because they need a voice that will give them credibility. They want to feel stronger in connection to themselves and not the town they came from. Law and order. <laughs> with Lauren, I was working with her on the aw sound, which is a high back vowel. A sore most of us, when we're not trained, work only in the center of the tongue. Everything gets flat. Everything is like this. Is all right. I'll go back to my New Haven Jewish accent. More, rather than more. Yeah. New York has a very sing-songy. Mm -hmm. So the more you can hear that, the more you can mm -hmm. start to even that out. And. As we move through all the sounds and we get those cleared up, we're going to move into melody. The people I grew up with are could be the cast of Jersey Shore. Um, let's pick some out, girls. What are we going to get on here? I really, I really like like the situation. Like, I love the situation. I mean, I didn't really show you guys you know, what's going on here. But... When you have very clear speech, I think that is an upper class thing. And just thinking that I deserve to sound that way from a girl from coming from Howard Beach to sound like I grew up on the Upper East Side is holding a power that I didn't come with. He didn't know what to expect. Almost. And so, every week, Miss Lo Giudice meets with Miss Singer to learn how to drop her Queen's accent. He didn't know what to expect. He didn't know what to expect. You're pushing on it. But I, I do get poked at. Definitely, I get this like poking fun at me because my accent is different. My brother's like, you know, what's your, what the hell is that accent? He's like, what the hell are you speaking? My sister's like, oh my God, water, water, <laughs> like water. I plan to tell you all about it later on. When people from my old neighborhood get frustrated with me, it's like, are you trying to be better than us? Like, I love my family, and I'm not trying to like run away from them. And it's like, it's divorcing yourself from where you came from, but yet you don't want to. You're not trying to leave them. You love them, but you are not like them anymore. An excellent uh, little story here, but it shows how you have this one girl who's trying to change her pronunciation. Why? To get a better job. She's trying to change her personality, but it's also, in a sense, changing her identity. She's no longer limited to this one area. She doesn't want to say goodbye to that old past, but she wants to have doors open to a new avenue. All because she's trying to change her dialect, her pronunciation, her accent. Uh, so people do this for identity, and it does change who they are. Uh, recommendation to all of you who have limited uh, pronunciation. Listen to what's going on around you. Find new opportunities uh, to change or adapt so that you can move in and out of different cultures and uh, dialect subgroups. 
All right, pronunciation was also was regional and it was social in identity. So regional, as I mentioned, going to Tennessee is going to be a regional thing. Social identity, as in the video of Miss Le Judice, she talked about one area being at, uh, at the beach and the other being on the Upper East Side, different pronunciation that was going on there, right? It was a social identity thing. And there are perceptions of accents. And what about you? What are your impressions about, you know, different accents? What do you think about someone who's quote-unquote uh, a southerner or someone who's a New Yorker or Brooklyn or someone from Boston or someone who's a Midwesterner, right? Someone with a British accent or an, an Irish accent or an Australian accent. Yeah? All of these, you have little impressions about who these people are. Are they smart? Are they dumb? Are they rude? Are they polite? Are they helpful, right? Are they slow, and we have all those different, we have all these different mentalities. And, pro, and, and in all likelihood, none of our perceptions are true, but we have that little box, right, that we put people in. We peg them there. Um, I remember one time when I met this uh, Chinese man, and he had a Chinese name. I forget what his name was. And uh, I began to speak with him and say, hello, you know, how are you? I'm expecting Chinese accent. And the gentleman comes out, comes out with an Australian accent, and I'm floored <laughs> because I see his name, I see his face, and I'm thinking, oh, he's Chinese, uh, born and raised in Australia. So he's got an Australian accent, very different from the perceptions from the real thing. Uh, all this to say we judge people based on their accent. Um, and that's not good or bad, okay, but we do do this. And the, good, the best, better thing would be then that after we get to know this person, we can rejudge them. <laughs> depending on uh, who they really are and not just on the way that they pronounce things. Okay, we tend to judge people based on vocabulary. Again, uh, the judgment here is not on uh, good or bad or right or wrong, but different choice, different choice of words. Uh, we do judge them, though, just like in the Pirates of the Caribbean. There are many different words that have the same meaning. And so the choice of word that you use, right, to uh, mind or to remember, Right, mind your manners, remember your manners, um, different choices of words that you're going to use. Uh, some ha words have uh, different meanings for the same word, and we can have a you know, uh, the example I used to use when I was growing up was a song by Michael Jackson entitled Bad Who's Bad? and bad actually meant good. Uh, same word, different meanings, and we can have words that have lots of different meanings. Uh, the one that I remember from uh, poetry was the word still, it has so many different meanings. It's the same word, okay, depending on how the word is used. Uh, again, we have the same type of thing here in the U.S. Um, we have lots of different words. And then, of course, what is a word, right? Are these words different? Ham and ham, right? Do they Are they the same or different for you? Ald and old, d and die, uh, twy and two, learnt and learned. Okay, we hopefully, for most of us, we're going to say there's a difference, but for some people, their pronunciation isn't going to be the same. How about words that are just completely different? Bairn and child. Bairn, you know where that comes from? If you know, let me know. Put it up on the boards. Uh, bairn and child. But if I hear someone saying a wee bairn, you know, a little kid, uh, it's going to tell me some things about where they're from, what their background is, right? Um, uh, God and went. Uh, burl and apen. I have no idea what those words mean. But there are differences, and depending on the word that you choose, um, people are going to judge you. Uh, I remember one pastor once talking about how uh, when when uh, uh, the the uh, Philistines came to Jesus and they had all these rocks, they were getting ready to stone this woman who was caught in adultery. And after Jesus spoke to them um, and said, "Whoever doesn't have this sin, you know, let them throw the first stone." And then the the pastor said, and then the past, and then the and then the the Philistines, not the Philistines, and then the Pharisees, they they drop their rocks and split, okay? and everybody starts to chuckle because Jesus would not have said, you know, and so they drop their rocks and split, and the pastor says, but that's what it said, you know, the actual passage says, and so they began uh, leaving one by one, beginning with the older ones, right, and the guy says, and that means they drop their rocks and split. Uh, word choice. <laughs> we wouldn't picture Jesus as saying something like that, or John in this case. Uh, but we do judge people based on the words that they use. Going back to you, who are going to be in school, pick the words that you use in your speech and in your writing carefully. Okay, A good word chosen can make a big difference. 
Uh, again, another famous quote, the, uh, uh, the difference between the almost right word and the right word is the difference between lightning and lightning bug. Pick your words carefully because words can have an impact on how people judge you. Okay, let's move on. Uh, words also changed in meaning. Uh, we had a word pikey, which was an aimless living person was walking around. Now we use that in turn pike. Uh, we, uh, so we've got changes that are going on. The uniformitarian principle uh, basically is a principle that uh, suggests that since human interaction is the same regardless of, of Arabs, regardless of time, whether we're talking about 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th century, regardless, People observe language use today the same way they did in the past, the, the principle of uh, um, uniformitarianism. What's ever been done now is also the same way that it's going to be done in the past. So the way we judge people today is going to be the same way that people were judged in the past. Uh, the, the real interesting thing is we don't think about how we judge people. We don't think about how others are judging us. Okay, so this principle is essentially the same, and so we want to be cognizant of that as we're judging people, and also when we realize that people are judging us based on our vocabulary. Other influences from other languages, we have words like autumn and fall. One of them is not from standard English. They come from a different language. Adder and viper, right? They both mean snake, and we got three words there. They come from different languages, right? Uh, Upton, who is the primary author for this uh, for this little section here, he he writes in the midst of his writings. He uses the word whilst, which I haven't heard very often. Whilst uh, someone else is doing something, while someone else is doing something, but he uses the word whilst. I thought that was rather interesting. The word choice that he used. Um, so anyway, different influences from different places. Regarding grammar, there are different grammars in certain dialects. Again, using while for until. You do this until I do whatever, and it literally means while, right? Uh, the word, the use of the word use. And do you, any of you use the word use? Well, it's actually used in Ireland as a standard word, right? There, the use of a reflexive without an antecedent. Okay, a reflexive is like is when you have self at the end of a word. Normally, you need an antecedent. You need something before it that it can refer to, right? It was himself who did it. Uh, I would typically say it was he himself. Uh, but some people, some cultures don't need the, the antecedent and just say it was himself that did it. Um, so rules that change as we go. Uh, now, grammar has now become limited because of standardization. In actuality, grammar has been limited. Sp uh, spelling has been limited because of uh, standardization. But because of standardization, we have words that aren't used anymore. Things like thine aren't used anymore. Mine and thine. Mine is used. Our and isn't used. Her and isn't used. Uh, those are phrases that are gone now. The use of subject pronouns as object pronouns or vice versa. Okay, Used to be okay. I gave it to he was legal at some point. Him went to the ocean. You understand who that is. Well, now I can't do that anymore because things are standardized. That's now wrong. Okay, but they didn't necessarily in the past. Standardization now requires people to use things in certain cases. These grammatical uses follow the standardization of language. Okay, um, I should be able to do that at some point in an earlier language, but it was it was deemed illegal. It was criticized by um, the received pronunciation by the RP. So standardization may have thought you know. Standardization made a lot of things quote-unquote good and correct and proper and made everything the same all over the place. But there are lots of words in the English language that do not follow the rule. We have irregulars in the language. So, for example, we have walk and past of that is walked. The, we have play and then the past of that is played. Well, we have teach and the past of teach should be teached, but we don't have that. It's irregular. Uh, now, Upton may say that the reason why this was done was to create a difficult... Uh, form so that only the elite knew them. I also believe, and not just me, but other other ling historical linguists believe that part of the reason why teach didn't become uh, teached uh, is because of standardization, because of printing. 
because words were put into print at a certain time and the process of converting everything to ed or converting everything to t even teached uh, was stopped, was stymied, okay? The natural progression of things was stopped and stymied because things were now etched into print and printers and publishers said, this is the way we're going to do it. Uh, had we not had printing, that evolution would have continued because there would have been no standardization going on, not nearly as stringently as it is now. So there were changes that were going on that were stopped, okay? Neither of the answers, by the way, teach or teached or taught were, you know, one was not better than the other. They were both used throughout, uh, throughout that era, right? Um, but because of the printing and because of, according to uh, others, because they wanted to create this special elite language, which was more difficult to understand, and also created um, shibboleths, uh, they wanted to keep it that way. Another example here. Uh, she come to town last night is an old English form. She come to town instead of she came to town. Uh, was legal at some point. It was not a problem. No longer is it because of the rules of, of the grammar. Double negatives were also used, and there were no problem with double negatives. Right Nowadays, you are not allowed to use double negatives, but they were used in early modern English. He didn't never have none. He didn't never have none. What's it mean? He never had any. That would be the proper way of doing it today without a double negative. Um, but then it was perfectly legal. Okay? Again, the rules were changed because of standardization. Obviously, the rules were also changed to keep people out, right? to use that as a gateway. There were other taboos with particular words like ain't, you know, that ain't ain't a word, and you ain't supposed to use that word because it ain't understandable. Um, in actuality, ain't is a perfectly good word, but the prescriptivists said, no, you're not supposed to use this word. So we're not allowed to use that word. So when you write for the academy in an academic setting, you write for business, uh, you ain't supposed to put that word in there. Ain't is not allowed. You need to use is not or am not. Um, and just the way they put it in. You know, it's not right or wrong. Okay, a good thing to recognize. Most uh, syntactic variation was also social in nature. Some were regional. So in some places you could say, give me it. Other places you'd have to say, give it to me. And in other places you could say, give it me. All of them were legal, depending on the region that you were in. Uh, most of these would be understandable to well, almost any region. But it tells, again, where you're from, what your educational background may be, um, what subgroup you may be in. Okay? Different variations in grammar. Some conclusions regarding this section. Dialects often uh, offered benefits to their speakers. Uh, if you're within a closed group and you know that dialect, you fit in. You're part of that group. Uh, so an outsider comes in and they don't know the dialect, they're going to be pegged as an outsider and going to be treated differently. Now, greater standardization was also a good thing because now we had more of a global language that we could use everywhere so that everybody could be accepted. But it was different from the local or the subculture or the regional culture, or the regional language. Provided greater utility, allowed you to do more things because you had that standardization, but it also took away from the local dialects. Question, why dis dialects? What's wrong with them? Why do people look down on them? Well, we do. We peg people according to the way that they pronounce words and the words that they use, the grammar that they use. People are quite willing to pass judgment on people based on their speech. may not be good, uh, but it's done, so beware of it. Uh, beware how you speak and beware how you judge others based on their speech. Variants have social meaning, and the society we have inherited places a store uh, by what speakers select from the available forms. What Upton is trying to say here is, look, we have all these different choices, and the choices you make peg you as a certain group or subset. Right? So we need to recognize that. If the received uh, pronunciation, the standard dialect, is kept irregular and so difficult to attain, fewer people might be expected to achieve mastery over it. And again, that's one of the reasons why they tried to make the rules and make them a little... Uh, non-standard at certain points, right? the irregulars, just so that it's more difficult for people to get in. Um, I do believe that some people did that, but certainly not all people. And that's all that I have for this section. I do thank you for stopping by. If you have any questions, you can certainly post uh, underneath here, and I'll be glad to answer your thoughts.